You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. Welcome to this episode of the Apple Insider Podcast. I'm Victor, and joining me is William Gallagher. Hello. Hi. Now, I should tell you all, I am so pleased. I, You know, I am so humbled and honored that you guys have stuck around with us this long. We are creeping up on episode 200. It's not this week, but it's coming soon. If there's anything that you'd like us to do for episode 200, if there's anything you'd like us to talk about, if there's anything that you think we should do to celebrate, go ahead and let me know. Go ahead and send an email to victor at appleinsider.com, and we will give that all the consideration we can. Now, there's a lot going on, and I, I think we have to start – with, gosh, I, I don't even know where to begin. Let's talk about the iPhone XR. A fine machine. Do you have one? No, I have a XS Max, but Malcolm has a, a XR, and I've been reading his work on Apple Insider about it. And I'm not going to say that I regret going the way I did, uh, but I'm very conscious it's a really good machine for an awful lot less money. Yeah, so it is. But there's there's things that have taken place that have really been interesting in terms of the business side of this. So first of all, the it appears that iPhone XR production has been cut based on questionably weak demand and, and also potentially some component quality issues. And so we had the wonderful announcement. We had the announcement of the phones followed by the announcement of the iPads and everyone was riding high on this and, and stock analysts were saying, you know, go ahead and buy. We think it's strong. And all of a sudden now, we're getting those analysts who are changing their recommendations from buy to neutral, which is is interesting. Now, that's happened by from Rosenblatt, and it's also happened from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. And that came after the quarter of the results where Apple said that they'd, they'd sold uh, 46.9 million iPhones in the first three-month period, just 200,000 more than the same period last year. Now, iPhone revenue year-on-year has increased in part due to the creeping up average selling price um but i you know i'm just digesting this information because there's something smells a little wrong here um there's weak demand fewer people are buying the iphone 10 r and there's a component problem um that just seems odd to me also uh is production in one place going but actually the iphone 10 r is made in several places do we know have they maybe just moved production? I'm, well, so here's here's odd. normally what happens, right? You contract with a manufacturer to produce the device, and they open up manufacturing lines so that they have the capacity to produce the, the output required. Mm-hmm. And when you reach the peak that you can with that supplier, you open up at a different manufacturer. And so you have multiple manufacturers manufacturing the same device. The other thing that can happen uh-huh. is... Even if you don't want – you don't want to place all your eggs in one basket so you can open up across multiple factories so that you guarantee that you'll have supply. Now, you don't want to produce more than you need. And so there's there's a report that came out that said that Apple was canceling plans with Foxconn and Pegatron to expand manufacturing supply. Now, Foxconn has 45 production lines that they're using even though they were anticipating and preparing for 60 which means they can turn out 100,000 less devices per day, basically. Okay, that seems quite a significant amount fewer. Um, doesn't, I just, I mean, if that's what's happening, that's what's happening, and it's interesting. Uh, I just I just got this feeling we've seen this before, and it wasn't later reflected when Apple announced actual sales figures, although, of course, they're never going to do that again. So we may never know that this is nonsense and there's something we're missing. Um, now, hmm. now, Pegatron said that they had a couple of shortages of parts and things, but that those issues were fixed at the end of September, basically. Uh, they, they don't have any product increasing their work, problem increasing their workforce. And so they're, they're happy in terms of their production capabilities. Apple was rumored to be dropping the ratio of Pegatron's production to 35% or lower and shifting work to Foxconn. But it looks like that's not actually happening. Um, the more recent report claimed that Apple's telling both Foxconn and Pegatron to stop any production expansion. And, and the, the guess is that when you do that, it's because demand is below expectations. Okay, so this boils down to Apple is doomed, isn't it? I don't know about doomed, but the question is, are we at peak iPhone? There's an argument, isn't it, that we're at peak smartphone 
Um, so that would make sense. It would fit. Uh, the other thing is, I would have expected Apple to be um, somewhat more attuned to that, or at least thinking about it a lot sooner than I would uh, for it. So, I mean, they're really good at anything logistical, aren't they? So predicting demand, I know it's not exactly a science, but it's close to it, and they're very good traditionally. So, again, this makes me think, are they likely to be caught unawares? If they launch something really naff, if there, if there was a ping version of the iPhone, then, yes, I could believe anything. But something uh, this good, this comparatively cheap, uh, I just I hold back from believing these things. And I don't know what would convince me. Maybe I'm just being a fanboy now. But there's something odd. Let me, let me help here. Everyone's okay. focused on the 10s 10s max and 10r numbers mm -hmm. lisa jackson was up on stage at the iphone event talking about conservation and encouraging people to use devices longer and trying to to make devices stay useful longer and in fact they sell an iphone 7 currently and they sell an iphone mm -hmm. 8 currently so those devices are there. People may still be buying those devices. You don't know. I don't know. And for people that already own those devices, is there a compelling reason to upgrade when those devices work brilliantly as it is? And and so that's where these analysts are coming from is that Pegatron is reporting that they're scaling back production because people are following through on what Apple is encouraging, which is the people to, to hold on to their devices and use them for as long as they're useful. Right. You know, if you okay. bought an iPhone 8 last you year, see do, why... you need a, do you need a 10s right now? Maybe not. Maybe there's actually no practical gain other than cameras and you won't feel the speed difference 99% of the time. So if that's true, then then what is the point, right? What is what is the point of going out and buying that new higher ASP device? And that's why these numbers look the way they do. Does that make sense? Uh, it does, but I could see why analysts uh, aren't taken with the idea of calling it a success when Apple talks people out of buying its products. So the, you, you talked for a moment about longer planning. And the question is, is that longer range planning when they're focusing on the environmental decision and keeping people locked in using their devices for longer periods of time? True, and that does make sense. I, I just, yeah, as much as I like what Apple does, I still have uh, a sort of generic business suspicion of a company that's looking um, to the bottom line over thousands of years instead of just to the next quarter. If only politicians would do that, I'd be okay. But that's another story. <sighs> They're all tired of those politicians, and I'm tired of them. Let's keep going. The, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, the the thing that you, you talk about, right, is is why should you buy that newer device? Well, one of the tests that we did, we ran a video of the 10R, the 10S, and the 10S Max all compared with the, the iPhone 10. And the big comparison that we did was how quick is it to unlock with Face ID? Now, obviously, it's not just a processor problem. It's also a problem of the true depth camera because there's a lot going on there. It's the cameras, it's the IR sensing, it's the secure enclave. There's there's a lot at work here in Face ID. Face ID uh, uses but... machine algorithms. It uses the neural engine, and the neural engine in the new phones is much more capable, has more cores, right? Well, this is what I'm thinking. Uh, all those things you said, I, I appreciate them, but every one of them should have been improved in the newer phones. So surely the XS Max just slams it compared to everything else. Isn't that the case? You think? Well, I hope so, because that's the one I've got. But uh, Place your bets. Okay, I'm going to go. I'm, I'm rolling the dice. I'm going to say 10S Max wins. Easy. Okay. So let's talk methodology for a minute. Okay. To try and make You're just the building test... this up now, aren't you? You're trying to just build up suspense while I'm waiting. But okay, I'll play this. To try I'm picturing. And... <laughs> Breathe. To try and okay. make the tests as fair as possible, our faithful tester's face was scanned on both phones under the exact same lighting conditions. Well, the iPhone 10 updated stored data map tests, tests over time, right? It updates its stored depth map. It, it would be best for testing purposes if both devices shared as close to identical data as possible. Now, that's not exactly possible because we weren't using each phone historically over time the same amount of time. First of all, we had the 10 for a year longer. And second of all, you, you don't hold up two phones and unlock all the time. It just doesn't practically work out like that. So 
that's one caveat for the testing. To determine the winner in each case, we did some videotape, and footage of the unlocking process was examined frame by frame to see which completed the home screen animation first. For the initial 15-round run, the iPhone XS was fastest 11 times, a tie was declared four times, and the iPhone X failed to finish first at all. Okay. So what we know is that Face ID is generally faster than the first generation version, but the fact that it had to be checked on a frame by frame basis strongly suggests that most people won't actually notice any difference at all. Well, it's like you said, you don't open two phones. So the odds of me turning from my iPhone XS Max to you know the XRs that I'm obviously going to buy in the next few days, they seem unlikely. Yes, uh, I'm impressed that it was done frame by frame. I'm disappointed that twins weren't hired to do this simultaneously now, on phones. Now, hold but. on, hold on. We did this again yeah. under low light conditions. And in the With second twins. trial... twins. No, okay, sorry. I'll be quiet now. In, in the second trial, not only did the iPhone XS win every single time, but in three instances out of seven, it was so noticeable, even without slowing the video down, that we could tell without checking frame by frame. Darker conditions give the newer models an advantage. And lastly, just because we could, you know, we tried at all kinds of different angles. So we were trying to unlock with Face ID at weird angles to the face and all over the place. And in this process, we discovered another weak spot for the iPhone X, which is if you hold the iPhone X down near your legs, the iPhone XS will unlock every single time in this situation. The iPhone X has to be lifted up a bit in order to unlock. Now, I grant you that's awkward. Don't hold your phone down near your legs. But the the point is, is that the XS, XS Max, and XR are faster, are noticeably faster under low light conditions. But for most people, it's not going to make much difference. No, I can see that. I mean, I'm, I'm intrigued, and I understand the parts that go to it. But you say this, and what occurs to me is, this is probably just me. I'm fully aware of that. But uh, every time my iPhone XS Max unlocks, uh, I'm still at the stage of thinking, that's really impressive. But I forget I've then got to swipe up to get to my home screen. I would expect it. I would like it to unlock and open so I can just get on with things. So for me, there's actually a marked delay between the unlock and doing something, but it's all me. Yeah. Now, it's it's just... You're just looking at me now, but okay. Go ahead. I mean, I'm... I'm still concerned about the notion that we've reached peak, peak iPhone. The the possibility that iPhone sales slow and that the profits come from services and from new Mac users, surprisingly. Uh, it, it's, it, it's one of these things where analysts want to see growth and they want to see continued growth. And just having a large pile of cash on hand is actually kind of a negative thing because it says that you're not spending it fast enough to do new things or do make new growth happen. Mm. And so that – do you see? Do you yes, understand it's perspective? just – I'm I'm not surprised. You know, you can't. Everything can't grow forever. There is a limit to it. Uh, I wouldn't have thought it would happen yet with uh, iPhones because there's, there's all those Android people who haven't yet seen the light. But you know, uh, it's going to happen some point, and it's now. Well, then I'm not surprised. But, you, know. you know, the 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 answer to peak iPhone is that the iPhone is a tool that keeps developing, and yes, it's pretty mature at this point, but. There are still things to do with it as evidenced by Face ID, for example. The other thing is the watch still has a lot of room to grow and mature. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're seeing the watch begin to grow up with watchOS 5 and Series 4. But it's entirely possible that it becomes much more of a health device. And right now we're seeing people begin to question it as a health device. There are doctors who are very worried that the echocardiogram capability in it is – going to cause people to go unnecessarily to hospitals because it will pick up blips or warnings. And they're, you know, of course, they, they say this with no actual evidence yet because that feature is not in wide distribution at this moment. But the idea that you could have real evaluative tools on your wrist that could guide you to seek medical attention is kind of a huge deal. Yes. And, you know, there's there's a lot of interesting consolidation in terms of health initiatives and insurance companies and how medicine is delivered. And the idea that, that having a wrist-worn device becomes a part of keeping yourself healthy is an interesting one. So we haven't seen the end of innovation from Apple, but I think a lot of people look to iPhone because iPhone is the largest chunk of 
profit from devices from Apple. It's also surely the biggest um kind of the phrase for it uh it is literally the biggest product ever made isn't it in terms of uh sales nothing comes close to iphone no one product does uh, so the odds uh, uh everything peaks everything declines the odds of apple or anybody being having a second thing to take over um that seems unlikely but yeah there will be something else i, I can well see the, the my watch uh replacing my phone eventually that's Definitely possible. We haven't talked about vision and augmented reality. True. And, True. and of course, we haven't talked about transportation. No. Um, yeah. Or the odds of me swapping to Windows 11 or whatever it's going to be called next. So, yes, lots of possible possibilities there. There are. Now, almost every day we hear something on the news about a cyber attack. And sometimes it's just a bunch of pranksters, but more often it's a foreign country with vast cyber resources trying to hack our power grid, our banking systems, or our military's information networks. The National Security Agency plays a big part in protecting our country from cyber attacks, and you can help. The NSA is hiring technical professionals to serve on the front lines of information security. If you work in computer science, networking, programming, or electrical engineering, you can help keep our country safe. Design new hardware systems and networks. Write faster, smarter programs. Protect America's critical infrastructure or help uncover what our adversaries are planning to do next. Learn more about careers at the National Security Agency today. Visit intelligencecareers.gov slash NSA. That's intelligencecareers.gov slash NSA. And the NSA is capitalized. We should talk about India. Okay, a fine, fine place. What have you got have in you mind? Been? Um, I'm trying to think. I, I seem to remember spending half an hour in India en route to something else. Uh, so I, I tick it on the box of countries I've gone to. But I feel I may not have appreciated the whole thing. I don't know why I think that. But if have you you've been? never left the airport, you didn't enter the country. That's my okay. attitude. I was out in the car park, if that counts. What about yeah, you? Have no, you visited? No, okay. no. I mean, you have to... If you don't go out and and interact with people in shops and try and order food and try and negotiate in a market, you haven't really experienced a place. Okay. Does that have does that work for you? Yes, it's just you seem to be dodging the fact have you experienced the place uh, in India? I have not been to India. It's on my list. Right. So we're two good people to be talking about this really, aren't we? Well, so I, I am a longtime watcher of different markets and how different markets behave in terms of device adoption. Yes. And and I'm also interested in how different markets have attitudes towards purchases, specifically bartering or negotiation or haggling and and how this works. Because there, there are some cultures where no means no, and there are some cultures where when making purchases, no means maybe. Mm. Or it means we just haven't come to agreement yet. Keep trying. And so you you know, the the for for example, there are some cultures where many people in England when I'm talking about things don't want to actually give me a no. They just want to soft pedal things and, and understand help that I understand that I'm going to pick up on the idea that they don't actually want to do the thing that I've been trying to get them to do. Yes. It's very I British to, to not actually say no. And in other cultures, no is the first answer because it's the beginning of negotiation, not the end. Mm, okay. India, in in my understanding, is is one of these cultures where no is the beginning of a discussion, and that depending on the the setting and depending on the context, there's very much a bartering tradition, uh, a haggling tradition, not a bartering tradition, a haggling tradition, of of starting especially in markets, by asking for deep discounts and then working towards a price that can be agreed upon. You know, the the the, the sense of it, and, and I'm sure that our Indian listeners will set me straight, but, you know, is this some old, old impression that I have that needs to be updated or have things changed? But, you know, the, the idea is that if, if the salesperson goes away smiling, then you lost the negotiation kind of feeling. <laughs> okay. Right. You know, you, you know, you should ask for, for, 50% or 70% off of the price that's first asked and then work up towards what they can be agreed upon kind of thing. And that it's not insulting to ask for that much. That that low-balling or low-bidding the price isn't immediately a sign of bad faith. 
Okay, and I'm reluctant to just sweepingly describe things, uh, you know, entire nations and well, countries, but I do recognise that type it's, in the British. So, yeah. It, it's an impression and that there is this this sort of tradition for it. And maybe it's not applicable and I'm asking people to update me. So I'm I'm open to, to understanding that things have changed. One of the things that I have noticed that's changed is the approach to smartphones and the approach yeah. to phones in general. So I have an older device. I have a Motophone F3. And the Motophone F3 was a very thin slab uh, soap bar phone that had an e-ink display. And as you might imagine, it had battery for days, right. like weeks and weeks and weeks of battery because the e-ink display sucked no juice. Okay. And it had multiple ringtones. And basically the way that, that phones were used at the time that this product was made was that you didn't have one phone per person. You had one phone per family. And in some right. cases, even one phone per extended family. And right. so you'd enter in people into your address book and you'd assign ringtones per family member so that it would ring differently and you'd know who was, was going to grab the phone. Uh, no, wait a second. You, uh, unless – I don't understand how that works. Uh, uh, you can easily assign ringtones to whoever's calling in but not who they're calling yeah. in for. Well, right. But if I know that that – this one person only calls for that family member, then you can assign it. Right. If you know you never speak to your mother, but other people do. Okay. Right. Yes. Yeah. We, we know that William calls to speak to me, and I oh, don't yes. answer, but William calls to speak yeah. to me. William is not calling to I'm, – I'm not calling William's Angela. I'm never calling no. Angela. Right. No, I've asked you not to. Yes. And so we know that you don't have to assign my the, you know, you know, Angela's specific ringtone to my contact record, Right. Uh, I have actually have. Sort it out? I've I've assigned a silence uh, of about three minutes as your ringtone. There you go. So she never Very knows. Good. But yes, okay. <sighs> exactly. So anyway, but that's that's how phones were used for a time, and now that's changed with the advent of more affordable Android phones, with the change in economy. That that th this instead of having one phone per family kind of thing, that that there's definitely a one phone per individual thing happening here. Now, this has an impact on Apple because Apple doesn't make as many sales in a setting like that, do they? Apparently not. I don't know the details, but I understand not. No? Okay. All right. So, so here's, here's what happened is that OnePlus, which is an Android phone maker, has made big inroads in India. And the impact on Apple is that that means the user base shrinks because more people are using Android and also means that sales shrink. So sales fall... In 2017, they were estimated to be about 3 million, and it looks like that drops to about 2 million now. The iPhone's local user base is is losing about 10% to about 9 million total. Now, 9 million doesn't sound like a bad number. 9 million is a nice number of people, isn't it? Well, yes, but India has at least 9 million and one people in it, so... Right. Mm -hmm. Well, there are 436 million Android wow. users. Okay. And to further complicate things for us here, half of the new iPhone sales are expected to come from old models. Okay. Yes, I see that problem. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Right. We're we're not we're not selling 10s Max in India successfully to large numbers of people. Right. Apple is selling the SE and the iPhone 6s. Okay. And and that comes down to product cost. That's really what that comes down to is is accessibility in terms of cost. Now the other problem is that iPhone Apple doesn't manufacture iPhone in India. And this this is an artifact from the end of British colonialism in India where when 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 India became free of of the British Empire uh, a number of factories have been set up to manufacture things over there. Uh, BSA and Enfield manufacture motorcycles over there. Okay. Sorry, my mind's so, on British colonial rule. I am a Brit, so yeah, this is yeah. not a part of our history that we enjoy talking about. But, okay. You don't look fondly yes. upon it. Okay. Yeah, now, not so much. Well, you know, you, you cannot buy a Royal Enfield motorcycle in England that's made in England. You have to buy one made in India. And what happened is that the the British set up these factories before before the empire kind of came crashing down over there. And they continue to this day. Okay. And so 
India has a strong bias and, and has set it up as a part of their economy where products that are not manufactured in India are subject to high import duties. It, it encourages local industry. It encourages investment in manufacturing and investment in local industry to, to move it out. Now, it's, it's, they do have factories that are outside of China. Foxconn set up one in Brazil for this very kind of reason. Same problem. Brazil, high import tax duties. Great. Foxconn opens up a plant in Brazil so they can make an iPhone in Brazil. So they're, they're losing about 15 to 20% of their tax incentive that they could have then passed on to the consumer to try and make the device pricing more palatable. Okay. They declined to produce low-cost new phones. So this is, this is an issue. The, the, the Samsungs and the OnePluses of the world are the, the successful phones, and they're about half the cost of an iPhone XR in India. So presumably they do um, manufacture it in India. Why do they not have the same concerns Apple does, whatever those are, about the ability uh, to manufacture in the country? It's a good question. First of all, we, we have seen that some of these devices do have some quality problems. And second of all, we have seen that the um, devices aren't meant to be in use quite as long. You know, Apple talks oh, about okay. longevity, right? Yes. Okay. But uh, 10 to 15% of OnePlus's new customers come from iPhone. It's, I'm, I'm always still stuck on the, the uh, an idea that India, of all places doesn't have everything you need to make great reliable products i mean uh, what do you need you obviously need materials but you need people uh surely there are well this is this is the question for people. why there aren't iphones made in england or why aren't iphones made in america okay and, so and it comes that. down it, it comes down to engineering it comes down to the way that manufacturing is done, it comes down to the economy in terms of what you pay workers. Okay. So it's, uh, the ecosystem doesn't exist in India or the US or England to make this, but it does in uh, parts of China and things. I can well, I can well so, understand that. So where Apple has chosen to manufacture outside of China, they used their contract manufacturer to import a plant. All right. Yes. Right? The Foxconn plant in Brazil, they, they brought a plant over. And, okay. and that's how it was done. And, you know, Foxconn is in a, a whole world of turmoil in Wisconsin right now because they were going to make screens in Wisconsin at the Foxconn plant that was going to be set up there. And there were all sorts of tax incentives that Wisconsin was putting forward to support the Foxconn plant coming in. And they kept increasing the tax incentives and Foxconn kept scaling back what the project was going to be. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Smaller numbers of employees, maybe instead of actually manufacturing things, we're just going to turn it into an R&D center. Uh, lots of stuff going on like that. And so, you know, it's, it's difficult to set up a manufacturing plant for iPhones in, in a new region. It's not something you can just say, okay, go ahead and do, because along the way, you end up dealing with local governments, you end up dealing with tax incentives, you end up dealing with economies that may or may not make sense in terms of paying the workers or in terms of just being able to pull it off. So none of that seems likely to change um, uh, quickly if it changes. So should Apple just give up on India? Well, no, because Apple needs the growth. Apple wants yes. growth in China. Apple wants growth in India. Now, the Indian government did modify their taxation and sourcing laws to allow single brand retailers, mm, Apple, that are foreign <laughs> owned to temporarily meet a 30% sourcing requirement by buying goods made in India and selling them in other countries. That's a five-year waiver. That that okay. helps some, but that doesn't, you know, that 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 doesn't quite take care of of this problem. Okay, but it sounds like a step towards it. And you said five-year plan. Then uh, over that gives five years and to come up with whatever other bits are needed to do this. So right at, at the end of the five years, the company would have to be re required to source thirty percent of their goods sold in retail stores from within the country. Right. Okay. Five years doesn't seem very long, actually, when you're talking about that kind of scale of things to do, but okay. Yes. Well, consider that it takes two years to design an engineer and build an iPhone. Yes. Yes. Two to three. Slackers, really, aren't they? So I see the point there. The Apple should pull their finger out. Not pull out of India, but pull their finger out in general, and everything would be fine. No. I mean, if, if they made more affordable devices and, and managed to make them at half price... 
right? Yes. But that's that's it's difficult, isn't it? Well, it's literally difficult in that um, we know component costs and things. And I, I don't yeah. like it when you, you hold, you're told, I don't know, an iPhone costs this much to build. It's like, yeah, the second one costs that much to build. The first right, one right. getting there was so much more. But even so, there is a, a demonstrable cost. Um, now, and it does reduce the scale and time. So, no, we, we should say that the iPhone SE models that are sold in India are built by Wistron in India. So that that does happen. They're they're marked designed in Apple, by, designed by Apple in California, assembled in India. So that went on sale in June of 2017. But again, it's an iPhone SE. That's a it's, it's an age old device, right? Yes, but they're very good phones. So uh, if they can right, make those, right? But you could have you could have an SE, a brand new old SE, or a brand new OnePlus. You see the problem? Yes. Okay. Good point. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's it's a difficult thing. And India keeps hoping that the price of the iPhone SE will be cut by as much as $100. But Apple's trying to preserve price in order to preserve margins. Yes. It's not very apple so, to cut prices. So I don't see that really happening. Not. Really soon. not. Really not. Okay. Yeah. Especially not lately. So this but... is a big so this difficulty. Is a thing. In, it, it's, okay. it's a problem, right? How do you address these developing markets without undercutting yourself and the rest of the world? And it's it's an issue. Now, Apple did surprisingly make the the iPhone XS and XS Max different for one region of the world. Yes. That is when they made the the Chinese versions that have two real SIM card slots as opposed oh, yes, to yes. rest of the world that gets a real SIM slot and an eSIM slot. Yes, that is interesting. Okay. So it, it shows that they want to market badly enough they're willing to make a modification and, and create a whole new SKU for it. Yeah. So the question is, what has to take place to make the Indian market worthwhile for them to come up with a whole new device? Well, you said a key word I thought you said there was developing. Um, is there some point when uh, the market, uh, I don't know, needs, wants, likes um, – particular capabilities that iPhones give that Androids don't, and then Apple's happy? Um, or is it really that um, Apple's always benefited from people starting with the earlier versions of things and staying with them forever, uh, that they nobody would catch, that they aren't in a position to catch up with other people? Is it somewhere between those two things that I made them very vague? I'm not even sure what you were saying. It fell down in the middle, <laughs> didn't it? So, okay. Let I me don't even know where you were going with that one. So it's it's a problem. I, I think Apple needs to have a competent, capable device that has the, the sheen of newness to it. And an iPhone SE is not a new device. And an iPhone 6S is not a new device. And an iPhone 7 and an iPhone 8 are not really new devices. What do they have to offer that is an affordable new device that's appropriate for this market that isn't going to make its consumers feel like they were suckers for buying a year's old device? Ooh. This is this is a problem. Do, do you see where I'm coming from with yeah. this? You know, this you, is where you the it. iPhone 9 comes in. They've planned it all along. It's ready. It's waiting. It's It's rubbish. Okay. It's not there. Ooh. It's not there. So anyway, that's that's the difficulty. I I don't know how you solve that when you're trying to run a worldwide program and try and keep SKUs as harmonized as possible. It's it's a difficult conundrum. Do you want to keep all the SKUs harmonized? Do you make exceptions for China? Once you start, do you make exceptions for India? What do you do? But it, you, you got to do something. Hmm. And and the iPhone SE is at the end of its life. We know it's a discontinued device. We know that there's no jamming an A12X Bionic into that thing. It's just not happening. So what what do you do to address this growing situation? Do you give well, up on I India, which has 436 million Android users? Who must be saved. Okay, we can't do that. Okay. Uh, I would actually say you hire Apple because this is a kind of logistics problem, the gigantic scale problem that they've been so good at solving in the past, but um, they can't hire themselves this time. Something's Maybe they have a secret plan. Maybe not for the iPhone 9, but maybe they're further down the line than we think. It just hasn't worked yet. Am I being Mr. Optimistic again? I think I am. Don't know why. I think you are. Okay. 
You bring it out to me. I think you are. Okay. No. Speaking <laughs> of not the optimism, so you were talking about having computer problems earlier today, weren't you? Yes, and lots of people I work with have had problems. It's like today, all Apple Macs in the world have thought, you know, I need a break. That's what I think has happened. So it's a very technical answer there. I hope you understood it all. Right. Now, incidents are inevitable, but it all comes down to how your company responds. Incidents require complex coordination between operations and software development teams who are the unsung heroes putting out fires every day. And getting alerts immediately is critical when an incident occurs. That's why there's Ops Genie by Atlassian. You know, Ops Genie empowers devs and ops teams to plan for service disruption and stay in control during incidents. It gives teams the power to respond quickly and efficiently to unplanned issues. It helps to notify all the right people through a smart combination of scheduling and escalation paths that takes into account things like time zones and holidays. And it allows for deep flexibility in how, when, and where alerts are deployed, supported by over 200 integrations like Jira, Amazon, CloudWatch, Datadog, New Relic, and more. And it tracks all activity and provides useful insights to improve future incident responses. Now, incidents can be anything from data center crashes to power outages to, to you know, database breakdown, all kinds of things that, that you really need to be able to be prepared for. For instance, I had a power outage just recently and because half of my devices are on UPS backup, but a few, it turns out, are not. And they are power over Ethernet devices, but they were not powered over Ethernet at that moment. Had I had them over PoE, I could have kept my whole network up, even in the, the face of power outage. It's, it's important that, that these kinds of things are planned for, but even if they aren't planned for, being able to be notified would have helped. Um, you know, just the other day, I was, was actually yesterday, there was an outage of internet service in another country where I take care of a few devices. And I, I noticed almost immediately that they were offline and was able to get on the phone and start talking about it and and trying to resolve it and and eventually we got things back up the when you're talking about remote management and you're talking about teams that rely on things notification is essential and with Ops Genie by Atlassian, your next incident doesn't stand a chance. Visit OpsGenie.com to sign up to get a free company account and add up to five team members. That's OpsGenie.com. Never miss a critical alert again with Ops Genie. You mentioned coming up on the 200th episode. That's really impressive. I mean, I hope I can be on it to at least wave at you and say congratulations. That'd be fun. Definitely, we should do that. Um, you know, we're talking about internationalism. Apple mm. is opening their first store in Thailand. I'm really surprised about that, actually. That you just assume Apple stores are everywhere, but the very first one in the whole country. I mean, it's, I'm very curious to see how big a reception it gets, because uh, all the ones around here, obviously, are queues. It's exciting, but the first ever has taken them ages. Well, so think about this. There, there are tons of countries where Apple does not have an official Apple store. What they have are service providers or licensed resellers. Mm. And the official licensed resellers in a country where there is no official Apple store tend to take on the decor of an Apple store. They, they will use the white walls. They'll use graphics on the walls. They'll use the wooden floor. They'll use the wooden tables. They'll, they'll try and imitate. They may even put their staff in the same colored T-shirts that Apple used to use <laughs> a couple years ago. Yes. And this... It, 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 the difficulty is that they take this on, but they don't actually take on all the same policies or levels of service or steps of sa steps of service for sales. So you walk in and the decor is like an Apple store, but the treatment may not be because the training isn't there. And so it's an interesting change when, when Apple starts to, to stick out their elbows and say, we're putting our first store in. It's a sign, and it changes things. You know, this is what happened when Apple introduced the stores in the first place in America, was that all of the licensed resellers got scared. What's going to happen to our business? Where are people going to go? They're not going to come to us anymore. And that business had to change. What happened is that those stores now take care of vintage product that the Apple store doesn't want to cover, and right. they look after business clients that the Apple store doesn't address well. The, the Apple store is happy to do business sales, but they don't really do business support, per se. Okay. If I've ever accidentally uh, admitted to an Apple Store person that I'm self-employed, I have been pressed on the business end, and they made it sound like a wonderful thing. But equally, um, I've had some bad experiences in Apple Stores. I don't think the training is still there. 
I mean, they aren't going to – well, so what happened is – and this is all the fault of, of British, actually. This is all the fault of England. <laughs> all right. We've done it again. What did we do this time? Well, you you had a fella named John Broward. Okay. Right. You know this name? Yeah. I'm just trying to distance myself. But uh, all right. Carry on. Yes. I'll so, take this one on the so chin. So he, he came from Dixon's and went to the Apple stores. And prior to Angela Aaron's. And he didn't last very long. He lasted about a year. Yeah. But along the way, he ruined all the policies at, at the Apple store. So the Apple store, when it launched, took care of consumers with a surprising amount of, of care and compassion and empathy and touch and enabled Apple store managers to make exceptions to written policy. You oh, know, your, your device know broke and it broke two weeks out of warranty. You know what? Fine. Take care of you. That's good. And and because he came from Dixon's who have uh, a reputation for customer service, <laughs> yes, feel free I to elaborate on that. Uh, they, well, they certainly have a reputation. Yes. Let's, um, uh, for legal purposes, perhaps just leave it at that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> See, you're 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 trying to be a, a considerate and measured, and uh, safe Englishman, yes. safe Englishman, and I'm being a brash American and, and just laying it all out there. Okay, we should be but, all we can be, <clears throat> but yes, okay. <laughs> we should be true to ourselves. So yes. the and and when those policies got put in place, they never got rolled back, and that is why. The, the Apple stores, you know, they used to have a red phone where if you stumped the, Mac, the geniuses, you could, they would pick up the phone and call home to Cupertino. And, oh, and I yes, that's more that. yes. show than, than actual need. But it used to be that the geniuses at the Genius Bar were trained in Cupertino. They flew them all out for a couple of weeks, trained them in Cupertino, and then flew them back to run the store. Yes. You know, there, there was a lot more about making them the, the real response. And, and and like I said, empowering stores to make exceptions. And that's gone by the wayside. And it really does have an impact. You you go and you get service that doesn't feel like Apple's done all they can to help you out. It's it's a problem. You know, and Neil Hughes encountered this with, with his iPhones a couple of times in a row where mm. you know he had Apple Care even and still didn't get the quite the level of service that that he was entitled to. It's not an, a fantastic situation. And, and of course, the problem is that when Miss Arntz came in, that none of those things were rolled back. Well, I'm disappointed that I didn't know about the, the ability to override written policy. I've just, I've encountered an inability to stick to written policy. I had an Apple Watch uh, problem that was covered out of warranty, and my local Apple store uh, denied that. And in the end, I've went on Apple's telephone support and Apple on the phone said yes and they replaced it uh, so in fact a couple of things like that have happened with my local store Birmingham uh, and so I don't go there I go to the nearest one uh, which is in Touchwood uh, part of Sully Hall and I've had good experiences there so I think it might be store to store differences um, but it never used to be it was universally great yeah and you know but the, the notion that you had to go to seek another avenue of support to get your problem addressed yeah. is is a difficult one. And there are people that find that. You know, there are people that start on the phone and then go into the store. And uh, I've I've heard of people from the phone support calling after that's happened because they see the record update from the store and saying, why did you do that? I was on the case. I was handling the case. Huh? And it, it gets a little maddening. Okay. I can tell you that this morning, a friend told me his wife went to uh, an Apple store, I better not name it, but it is in the UK, and said uh, the service was so bad, she walked out and bought an iPad from Argos instead, which is uh, like a catalogue retailer. Um, and the, the description of the problems she had were so un-Apple like that you wonder if somebody was having an exceptionally bad day um, but when it happens a lot you just wonder I'm disappointed because I think uh, Angela Arons has done a really interesting job and the fact that she's been doing it for five years so it's like six times longer than your man Ballard it's just you would have thought she would have fixed things that seem to be so demonstrably still a problem I presume she's doing lots of other things but that's in our face I, stuff 
I think the answer is that, yes, she is doing lots of other things, from revamping what it means to be a store to being a public square, from all of the different programs and, and lessons and coursework that they're offering to, to all of the other things, that, that these basic details, because they predated her in the job, just never were apparent. Well, it is very different being uh, the third person to run a business than the one who comes in fourth, or even second, really, as Ballard was. Um, but this is a woman who is in charge of the retail side of a trillion-dollar company. Um, I, I think she's on top of sales issues uh, before she is uh, anything else. And this seems to me like a sales issue. As really interesting as all the workshops and the Today at Apple stuff is, in the end, she's got to get people through the door to buy stuff. And if they're leaving again unhappy, you, you, I can't imagine it isn't a concern for her. I just wonder how it gets to her radar. I don't think it's on her radar. Okay. It's, I was thinking it would be because, interesting to cover because, this in some way, but how do you measure yeah. this? Um, there are 506 stores now. How can we uh, assess uh, I mean, as far as, as they know, they're number one in customer saddle across everything, so they, they don't feel the problem. Right. So it's down to us whenever we get a... Um, uh, how did we do email to fill it out truthfully? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So it is. You know, they, how are they going to capture the, the the acquaintance of yours that went to Argos? How are they going to understand that response? Good point. Yes, they aren't. Okay. This is there's, one case no actually good way where to capture that data. You can assume the person who didn't sell her the iPad. Uh, is also not selling iPads to other people. But since I believe Apple still has this thing that you're not uh, paid by commission. Um, yeah, there's no commission. So, which I've also is a very good thing uh, as a positive customer relations thing. You get true advice, you get real things. And I've had people in the Apple store tell me not to buy Apple stuff. When I've described what I wanted, they said, no, you need this and this instead. And by the way, you can get them in that store over there, which is fantastic because it means I believe them when they say Apple stuff. In this case, it would be a measure of how badly this one particular person in this one store appears to be doing. Mm -hmm. mm. Anyway, that's that's yes. all the time I have for that rant. Join <laughs> us on appleinsider.com for more coverage about iPhone 10R, 10S, 10S Max and about the the Qualcomm situation. We didn't even touch about the Qualcomm situation. Oh my goodness, so Qualcomm. Uh, Qualcomm, Qualcomm, yes. Phew. Right? They they had asked for this delay. The, the short summary is Qualcomm had asked for a delay to try and wrap things up. Qualcomm's difficulty is that they're appearing in front of Judge Lucy Coe, who also presided over the Samsung trial. She did not grant the delay. And instead, she gave a ruling. And the ruling is so far that Qualcomm has to license their modem technology to other modem manufacturers. This okay. is interesting. This is only a good thing for MediaTek and a good thing for Intel and a good thing for Apple in terms of having supplier selection. Presumably, it's not a good thing for Qualcomm. You were explaining this to me a few weeks ago when they were going for the request, and it didn't seem unreasonable what they were asking, but apparently Well, not. so Qualcomm gets licensing fees from it, which is good news for Qualcomm, but Qualcomm doesn't really like having competitors. They don't want other people making modems with their technology. They want to be the sole supplier of that, and so less good. Okay. Everybody's now, this thing is not dream. over by any means. It's not, it's not completely over. But this is an interesting development because that opens doors for Intel and for MediaTek. <coughs> is and anything that, ever over in a, a legal case in America? I mean, yes. I, I hear Judge yes, Coe's yes, name is. all over the place. Samsung, Samsung totally stuff. finished. Samsung, that, that case has ended. And yet I'm waiting it for the shoe to drop. Okay. Nope. Nope. The, 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 the shoe you're waiting for is called Qualcomm. Okay. Right. <laughs> Join us on AppleInsider.com. Find William online at W Gallagher on Twitter. I'm, uh, I'm V Marks on Twitter. And email William at William at AppleInsider.com. Let us know what we should do for that 200th episode. We will be back next week. Thank you so much. 